Jesus is here talking to the 70 disciples who had just come back from their missionary tour. And here's what he says to them in Luke chapter 10, verse 18. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, when did this happen? Um, When did Satan fall like lightning from heaven? And of course, we answer quickly, when he sinned and got kicked out of heaven. And so we're going to stage one. Here's the passage we usually think of in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 to 9. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now notice, when we make this connection here, we are actually equating two different phrases. Jesus said that Satan fell, but here in Revelation 12, it says that he was cast out. So, is that right? Are these two phrases equivalent? Now, before we move along, please notice the Bible reference. It is Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 to 9. Okay, now the plot thickens a bit as we move on to stage two. Notice what Jesus says in this verse, John 12, verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. All right, now this is just before the crucifixion. And we usually think of that event as the time when the ruler of the world was cast out. So is Satan's being cast out in this verse the same as his being cast out in Revelation 12? Now, if it is, does that mean that Revelation 12 is really talking about the crucifixion? Then what's the fall from heaven before the creation of the earth? Desire of Ages, page 761. Christ bowed his head and died. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Now notice the the passage here that she is quoting from. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10. Why is Ellen White quoting that verse when she's talking about the crucifixion? And for what it's worth, is there any difference between being cast out and cast down? Well, a little bit confusing, isn't it? When was he cast out? When was he cast down? Beginning of the whole process? During the middle of it? Maybe it's time to make a little sense out of all of this, and maybe this will help. Manuscript Releases, Volume 12, page 411. After the crucifixion, Satan saw that he had overreached himself. Satan saw that his disguise was torn away that the character he had tried to fasten on Christ was fastened on himself. It was as if he had the second time fallen from heaven. Now that is clearly at the cross that we're talking about. It's like there's something about these two events, the fall of Satan in heaven and the death of Christ on the cross that is so similar that inspired writers seem to put them all together and use similar phrasing and make them almost like one event. Actually, Ellen White even made the linkage stronger. Youth Instructor, June 21, 1900. God looked upon the victim expiring on the cross and said, It is finished. The human race shall have another trial. The redemption price was paid, and Satan fell like lightning from heaven. All right, so you have stage one and stage two in this process. Two distinct falls of Satan that occur here. So let's move to stage three. Does this look familiar? Revelation chapter 12 again. And yes, it really is stage three. The accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. 
Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. Now let's focus on a few particulars right here. The accuser of our brethren has been cast down. Has been cast down. And there is a group of people who have beaten the devil. They overcame him. Placing their lives at risk in the process. Their lives were at risk of death in this process. Because they overcame, that's what therefore means here, because they overcame, the heavens and everyone who lives there can rejoice. But these events appear to be bad news for all those who live in the wrong places. Now it says the devil is running out of time and he's really mad about it. All right. The accuser of our brethren has been cast down. A group of people have beaten the devil, placing their lives at risk in the process. Because they overcame, everyone in heaven rejoices. But everyone on earth or in the sea is in trouble because the devil is running out of time and he's really mad about it. Just step back a little bit here. Look at this list and tell me when this all comes together. How about the end of time? Our time. The period of time in which we are living, in which this is all going to come together. Great Controversy 623. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Fearful are the scenes which call forth this exclamation from the heavenly voice. The wrath of Satan increases as his time grows short, and his work of deceit and destruction will reach its culmination in the time of trouble. So could it be that this passage in Revelation 12 is really talking about three different episodes in Satan's life? We've got the fall of Satan 6,000 years ago. We've got the crucifixion about 2,000 years ago. And we've got the time of trouble sometime in the future. So what's going on? What do these three events have in common? Christ's Object Lessons 296. Satan is an accuser of the brethren, and his accusing power is employed against those who work righteousness. The Lord desires through his people to answer Satan's charges by showing the results of obedience to right principles. Now, after, after we add another couple of pieces to the puzzle, I think the picture will be nice and clear. Acts of the Apostles, page 551. The completeness of Christian character is attained when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within. It is the atmosphere of this love surrounding the soul of the believer that makes him a savor of life unto life. So, answering Satan's charges involves more than pure doctrine, and that's important. But far more important are the lives which God's people live in this final demonstration. All right, now it's time for stage four, kind of right back where we started. Like the apostles, the 70 had received supernatural endowments as a seal of their mission. When their work was completed, they returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Jesus answered, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. The scenes of the past and the future were presented to the mind of Jesus. Now notice carefully, past and future. He beheld Lucifer as he was first cast out from the heavenly places. Now that one is definitely past. That's stage one. Lucifer cast out from the heavenly places. He looked forward to the scenes of his own agony when before all the worlds the character of the deceiver should be unveiled. He heard the cry, It is finished, John 19, verse 30, announcing that the redemption of the lost race was forever made certain, that heaven was made eternally secure against the accusations, the deceptions, the pretensions that Satan would instigate. All right? 
So then when, this is the near future when Jesus is speaking. Stage two, when Jesus will culminate his work on the cross. Beyond the cross of Calvary, with its agony and shame, Jesus looked forward to the, the great final day when the prince of the power of the air will meet his destruction in the earth so long marred by his rebellion. Jesus beheld the work of evil forever ended and the peace of God filling heaven and earth. So now we've jumped to stage four. The final destruction of sin and Satan, his last fall from heaven which is obviously still future. All right, what about stage three? Here it comes. Henceforward, Christ's followers were to look upon Satan as a conquered foe. Amen. Upon the cross, Jesus was to gain the victory for them. That victory he desired them to claim, he desired them to accept as their own. All right, stage three is not quite as well defined as the others, but they're all there. And where is this little gem that we're reading from? Desire of Ages, page 490. Have you read Desire of Ages recently? It's all there. The great controversy and how it will be settled. A quick recap. 6,000 years ago, the members of the Godhead understood Satan's plans and arguments and rejected them. Satan was cast out of heaven. 2,000 years ago, Angels and unfallen worlds understood Satan's plans and arguments and rejected them. That's when Jesus died. Near future, hopefully, the 144,000 will understand Satan's plans and arguments and will reject them. And then 1,000 years later, the wicked will understand Satan's plans and arguments and will reject them. Does God have a good plan? Does he understand how to make this happen so that there will never be another uprising of sin in the world and the universe? All right, who is missing from this picture, though? We have the members of the Godhead. We have the angels in the unfallen worlds. We have the 144,000. We have the wicked. Well, it's the righteous dead. Where are they? Now hold that thought. We're going to come back to them in just a little bit. The fall of Satan. Now, naturally, it's easier to understand the first two parts since they've already happened. But, you know, the most important part of this whole sequence for us is stage three, isn't it? Because we actually have a chance to do something about that one. We didn't have much to do in stage one. We didn't have much to do in stage two. We won't have much to do in stage four. But stage three... At the very least, we should be working on that. All right? So let's focus on the last two parts right now, stages three and four. Let's start with some basic points. Matthew 24, 14, a very familiar verse. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. Everybody knows that. But I'd like to ask if there is a reason for that order of events that we've been talking about. It's a common assumption that the gospel must go to the world before the end can come. Now, as we work our way through this, we'll find that that assumption is correct. But why? Why does the gospel have to go to the world? Here's a hint. It isn't so that everyone has a chance to be saved. Billions of people have already died without hearing the gospel. And since Zechariah and Paul talk about the unenlightened heathen who will be saved, it looks like God has a way of dealing with that problem. A people who never have a chance to hear the gospel and yet will find salvation. So why does this gospel need to go to all the world? What's the point of that? The real point is, which gospel is this gospel? If the Pope could preach an evangelistic series that was broadcast to every person on earth, would the end come? How about Benny Hinn, or Pat Robertson, or James Dobson, or Joel Osteen, Ted Wilson, or Dwight Nelson, or Doug Batchelor, or Mark Finley? The point is, this gospel has to be complete, mature, and powerful enough to bring on the end. 
That's what this gospel, which goes to all the world, must be. To whatever extent my gospel falls short of that, I fall short of ever finishing God's work, no matter how much I do. In the Lord's service, you see, quality is always more important than quantity. Our failure, my failure, to master the science of salvation is the greatest holdup in the great controversy today. And Scripture talks about that holdup in the Lord's plans. And after these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. So, what's the holdup? The sealing is holding up God's plans. It is also holding up Satan, by the way. He started falling a long time ago, and he should have hit the rocks all, uh, by now, but it's only because we're not ready. I'm not ready for the ceiling that he seems to still be floating down and hasn't fallen completely yet. All right, why can't God's plans go ahead without the ceiling? What makes this ceiling so necessary? What does it accomplish? Let me toss another verse into the mix here. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Notice it says here, by the church. Somehow the church, people like you and me, will provide a demonstration of the manifold wisdom of God that is so different than anything else the world has ever seen that the principalities and powers in the heavenly places will learn something new. It's quite a thought. That demonstration is to be made through the ceiling. So now we can say that it is the need for the demonstration of the wisdom of God that comes through the ceiling of the 144,000 that is holding things up. That looks like a pretty loaded question, doesn't it? What is the wisdom of God? Almost a presumptuous question. After all, who am I to be talking as if I understand the wisdom of God? Well, bear with me a little bit. Let's consider what we can learn by asking four questions about this specific part of God's wisdom that is to be demonstrated to the principalities and powers of the heavenly places by the church. What plans are being held up? What wisdom of God could possibly require demonstration? What specifics need to be demonstrated? And can the ceiling demonstrate what is needed? We're just going to walk our way through these in order. So our first question is obviously, what plans are being held up? Well, the plans we started out talking about, the end that is to come after the gospel goes to all the world. In other words, everything from the ceiling on. That's what's being held up. And five big items stand out. The close of probation, the time of Jacob's trouble, the second coming, the reward of the righteous, the destruction of the wicked. Those plans are being held up. They are waiting. Okay, hold that thought a little bit. We'll go to our second question. What wisdom of God could possibly require demonstration? Now remember, this is for the benefit of the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places. Now that's a loyal audience. Don't they trust him? Reward of the righteous, destruction of the wicked. Now, not coincidentally, these last two items on the list we just looked at previously come to mind again, and for good reason. Satan has been complaining about God's plans on these two issues for several thousand years. And the unfall, unfallen inhabitants of the heavenly places have a stake here as well. Remember, sin began in heaven. Lucifer was once their friend. Angels have good reason to make sure that God's plans, number one, don't endanger heaven. 
And number two, that he doesn't execute the wicked needlessly. There are questions that need to be answered. Remember our third question now. What specifics need to be demonstrated? Suppose a teacher gave a math test and everyone flunked. Suppose the teacher announced later that seven students would get passing grades anyway. You'd want to know what made those students different, wouldn't you? And the teacher said, it's because they have blue eyes. Would you think that was fair? Especially if you didn't have blue eyes. The problem is that blue eyes have nothing to do with math tests. Just not a good reason. Well, what would be a good reason that they could pass? Well, maybe if the class studied the lesson again and then took another test. If the seven students showed that they had learned how to do the math, that would make more sense. Okay, we've solved our problem, haven't we? Well, I just changed the screen, but it's no different, is it? Does the second test guarantee that they'll never again mess up another math question? So does it sound like a good idea to take people to heaven who have failed and got a second chance and got it right? Even passing a second test. And what about those who failed twice and he gave them a third test? What if the teacher gave them a fourth test? Wouldn't they learn sometime? How many chances should someone get before the teacher says, I give up, this student is hopeless? And how can you say that when the consequences aren't just a failing grade, their eternal death. On what basis can God take people to heaven safely? So back to our question. What specifics need to be demonstrated? To justify his government's rulings on the reward of the righteous and the destruction of the wicked, God needs to do three things. Number one, Show that there is a good reason some are lost and some are saved. Now, this is vitally necessary to counter Satan's claim that because God's people have sinned, they are no more entitled to salvation than he is. Or better yet, he deserves salvation just as much as they do. God has got to show there's a good reason that some are lost and some are saved. All right? Number two, to show that the people he wants to take to heaven are safe to have there. Don't you think the unfallen inhabitants of the universe are a little afraid of having us as their next-door neighbors? Don't you think they need to know that the ones that will be there are safe, completely saved? And then the third one, to show that there is nothing more that even God could do to help the wicked, to establish that God's love and His justice are entirely compatible the wicked need to be proved to be completely lost without hope of redemption. And so here's our fourth question. Can the ceiling demonstrate what is needed? It's probably no surprise to find that I believe it can. So let's get started by looking at some basic information. The seal of God, Revelation 7 and 9, is contrasted with the mark of the beast in Revelation 13. A seal is an official sign of authority. It gives the essential information, usually the name, title, and jurisdiction of the individual organization or government it represents. All right. This information is found in the Sabbath commandment, the name, the Lord. The title, the creator, the jurisdiction, heaven and earth. The mark of the beast is readily identified as the claim to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday. And then in the little book, The Faith I Live By, page 287, a settling into the truth so they cannot be moved. All right? So, so far, so good. The Sabbath is the seal of God's government. Knowledgeable and determined opposition to God's authority in the form of Sunday exaltation, is the mark of the beast. When God's people settle into the truth intellectually and spiritually so that nothing can move them, they will receive the seal of God. That's very basic information. The seal of God is placed in the foreheads of the 144,000 before the close of probation. 
The close of probation marks the end of Christ's work as high priest in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Now, I used to think that the seal of God was sort of a diploma, a sort of heavenly good housekeeping seal of approval. But it finally dawned on me that the seal is given before the final test. Teachers don't do that. You don't hand out diplomas before you know whether or not the student has passed the finals. So what's going on here? The conflict between the observance of Sabbath and the mark of the beast reaches its peak during the time of Jacob's trouble, when those resisting the combined religious political of the the world are condemned to death. And that occurs after the close of probation. All right, how did Jacob get into this trouble? Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 5 to 7. For thus says the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with child. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labor, and all faces turn pale? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Now, passing note, when the words labor and travail are spoken of in prophecy, they always have some application to this time that we are living in. Jeremiah is the one who put Jacob's name on this occasion, but he is clearly referring to the story of Jacob's night of wrestling by the river Jabbok, which comes from Genesis 32. Remember the story, Jacob is returning home after his 20-year absence when he gets word that his brother Esau is coming with 400 armed men. Not a good sign. Realizing his only hope is God, he spends the night praying, and at midnight, someone attacks him. Genesis 32, 24 to 30. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. But he said, Let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said, you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Now notice, the one he has been praying to is the same one he has been fighting. What does he believe? That God loves him and wishes him well or that God hates him and wants him dead? It's faith versus sight and feeling, and hearing, and smelling, and the taste of blood, which is stronger. This is the basic test of the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, Jacob is not the only illustration of this. Other stories add insights. We have only time to look at a couple of them quickly. Under extraordinarily difficult circumstances, when to Job it seemed that God was out to kill him, Still he maintained his trust and loyalty. Job 13, verse 15, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. An interesting side note is that this whole test was Satan's idea. And God went along with it. Lest anyone think it was an insignificant event, remember, it cost the lives of about 100 people to set up this test for Jacob. The ones that we read about in the first chapter of Job. But the ultimate example is Jesus in Mark 15, verse 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What makes this test special? Millions have died for their faith. What's the difference here? This is not the normal test of martyrdom, because at this time, with no high priest, To intercede in the heavenly sanctuary, the 144,000 feel no sense of God's abiding presence. Every sensory input tells them that God is their enemy. Signs of the Times, November 27, 1879. Those who live in these last days must pass through an experience similar to that of Jacob. Foes will be all around them, ready to condemn and destroy. Alarm and despair will seize them, for it appears to them as to Jacob in his distress that God himself has become an avenging enemy. Now notice, 
after making every sacrifice imaginable to remain true to God's government, facing imminent death because they refused to disobey His commandment, with no possible hope in anything but God, that's when God seems more like an enemy than a helper, after the close of probation. Do they still trust Him? Why such a test? Because it has to be the absolute most difficult test of faith ever possible under any circumstances. Nothing less can show that they trust God so much that they will do His will even when it doesn't make sense to them. Nothing less can show that they are saved enough to be safe in heaven for the universe to trust them. Before we go on with our line of thought, I can't resist taking just a moment to show how Ellen White describes the outcome of this test. Signs of the Times, November 27, 1879. Dangers thicken on every side, and it is difficult to fix the eye of faith upon the promises amidst the certain evidences of immediate destruction. But in the midst of revelry and violence, there falls upon the ear peal upon peal of the loudest thunder. God utters His voice from His holy habitation. The captivity of His people is turned. With sweet and subdued voices they say to another, God is our friend. That's the issue, isn't it? Is He against us or is He with us? Isn't it great that the hardest test that has ever come to a group of human beings can be passed by any child who's learned, Jesus loves me, this I know. All right, back on our main track again. What does this test show? By placing his seal on the 144,000 before, before this most difficult of all tests, God provides convincing evidence that he can correctly identify those who are safe to let into heaven. The seal, my friends, is not a diploma. It's a demonstration of God's wisdom that helps his loyal subjects feel more comfortable with people like you and me coming to live as their next-door neighbors. But it does more. Because everyone on earth at this time is familiar with this gospel, meaning the true gospel, and only those who have faith pass this test, and all those who have faith pass the test, this test shows that faith is necessary for salvation and faith plus a knowledge of this gospel is sufficient for complete obedience. This is why the gospel has to go to all the world. You see, the test can't be carried out properly without simplifying the situation down to a single variable. Only when the question of knowledge is standardized throughout the whole world, the whole world understands what God is saying and what the issues are, can the role of faith be clearly seen. It's a bit like working on a car. You don't do a major engine overhaul and switch gasoline brands at the same time because you don't know which is going to solve the problem. Your car's performance might change, but you wouldn't know why. You have to stick with one variable. And the variable has to be faith. Who has faith? Why is all this important? Aside from proving that the 144,000 are safe to let into heaven, the demonstration happens to be exactly what is needed to take care of that one group of God's creatures who got left out of the four stages of Satan's fall. Remember them? The righteous dead. Here is Martin Luther. He didn't keep the Sabbath. He was all confused on infant baptism. He lived on roast beef, sauerkraut, and beer. He was not the most patient of individuals, but he had faith. Now Jesus says, I can teach Martin Luther the details of this gospel when I get him to heaven. But the investigative judgment has already found that he had true faith. Is it okay with everyone if I take him home with me? And there won't be a single voice to raise an objection because righteousness really is by faith. Righteousness really is by faith, always has been, always will be. I really like it when things make sense. Martin Luther's faith allows him to be saved 
with an incomplete knowledge of God and His plan of redemption. But something more is necessary before Satan's arguments can be cast down. Something more is necessary. What the test shows. Review and Herald, April 16, 1901. All heaven is waiting to hear us vindicate God's law. Testimonies, Volume 5, 746. If there ever was a people in need of constantly increasing light from heaven, it is the people that in this time of peril, God has called to vindicate His character before the world. Ye shall receive power, 338. The honor of the law of God is to be vindicated before the unfallen worlds, before the heavenly universe, and before the fallen world. The final test, you see, is not about my salvation. It's about whether God's law and His character and His plan will be vindicated. It is really God who is being examined here. Is God's way really a foolproof way to preserve the universe? That's the question. Notice also the future direction of these statements. This is not about stage two and what happened at the cross. This is about us and the people who live at the end of time. Notice also that this vindication demands increasing light from heaven because God can only be vindicated by pure truth, never, never by honest untruths about His law and His character. Martin Luther lived in a time of limited light and thus could not vindicate God because he was telling honest untruths about the character of God. But Martin Luther's faith was sufficient to save him, but insufficient for the final vindication of God and the defeat of Satan. So, do we need light from heaven? This last test is not about our salvation, although that's involved. It is to answer all the remaining questions on all levels, fallen and unfallen. The remnant of Revelation 12 was not called into existence to repeat the mission of Martin Luther or John Wesley or Billy Graham. It was called to vindicate God's way of accepting and rejecting sinful men and women. Is God's way fair to all men and will it protect the universe from repeating the whole sorry mess? So what the test shows, God is fair in saving people with limited light on the basis of their faith. The sealed final generation shows that true faith will lead to obedience to complete light when it is available. Therefore, those who died with limited light will not jeopardize the safety of the universe because their genuine faith will always respond in obedience to new light when they hear it. The ultimate mission of the last prophetic church is not to be saved, my friends, or even to lead others to salvation, although both of these goals will be accomplished by them. But the goal and the purpose is to annihilate Satan's last remaining arguments against God about his character, his law, and his method of saving sinners. We are here as God's final piece of evidence necessary to end the experiment of sin and preserve the universe from any similar experiments in the future. But we're not quite done. Fast forward a thousand years. After a thorough examination of the books of record to answer every question about why this one or that one is not among the redeemed, the time has come to finish sin and sinners forever. You know the story. Jesus descends on the Mount of Olives. The earth splits to create a great plain. The new Jerusalem comes to rest. Soon the wicked are raised to life. And after a period of unknown duration during which they prepare their weapons and organize their forces, they are finally ready to attack the city. At last, the order to advance is given, and the countless host moves on. 
an army such as was never summoned by earthly conquerors, such as the combined forces of all ages since war began on earth could never equal. Satan, the mightiest of warriors, leads the van, and his angels unite their forces for this final struggle. Kings and warriors are in his train, and multitudes follow in vast companies, each under its appointed leader." With military precision, the serried ranks advance over the earth's broken and uneven surface to the, to the city of God. By command of Jesus, the gates of the new Jerusalem are closed, and the armies of Satan surround the city and make ready for the onset. You recognize that from the Great Controversy, page 664. Now, up to this point, I don't know of any, re any means by which God has shown the universe that it's absolutely impossible to reclaim those who have rejected faith. Well, what about the little old lady down the street who grew pretty roses and gave cookies to the neighborhood children but never accepted Christ? Yes, the book of records shows a lot, but isn't there some way to reach her? A second test, a third test, a fourth test, one more chance? Wouldn't you ask during the millennium? Wouldn't you care? Would Jesus, the one who is the same yesterday and today and forever, the one who said, whoever comes to me I will by no means cast out, the one who has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, would Jesus let a repentant and trusting sinner in? So, one more thing needs to be revealed. As soon as the books of record are opened and the eye of Jesus looks upon the wicked, they are conscious of every sin which they have ever committed. They see just where their feet diverged from the path of purity and holiness, just how far pride and rebellion have carried them in the violation of the law of God. The seductive temptations which they have encouraged by indulgence in sin the blessings perverted, the messengers of God despised, the warnings rejected, the waves of mercy beaten back by the stubborn, unrepentant heart, all appear as if written in letters of fire. Above the throne is revealed the cross, and like a panoramic view appear the scenes of Adam's temptation and fall and the successive steps in the great plan of redemption. From Great Controversy, page 666. This panorama, this visual demonstration in the sky in which every individual will see what God did to save him or her and what they did to reject his love. It is now evident to all that the wages of sin is not noble independence and eternal life, but slavery, ruin, and death. All, all see that their exclusion from heaven is just. Those who have united with Satan see the total failure of his cause. Satan sees that his voluntary rebellion has unfitted him for heaven. His accusations against the mercy and justice of God are now silenced. And now Satan bows down and confesses the justice of his sentence. Every question of truth and error in the long-standing controversy has now been made plain. God's wisdom, His justice, and His goodness stand fully vindicated. Pages 668 to 670. You see, in all that multitude outside the city, not one can be found who has faith in God's love. As the faithful 144,000 pass the hardest of all tests and show the power of faith, so the faithless wicked fail the test and show their total depravity. And finally, the entire unfallen universe knows there is nothing more that even God himself could have done to save them. More time will not help. Miracles will not help. Additional demonstrations of love and patience will not help.
Great Controversy, page 671, says, Notwithstanding that Satan has been constrained to acknowledge God's justice and to bow to the supremacy of Christ, his character remains unchanged. The spirit of rebellion, like a mighty torrent, again bursts forth. He rushes into the midst of his subjects and endeavors to inspire them with his own fury and arouse them to in instant battle. But of all the countless millions whom he has allured into rebellion, there are none now to acknowledge his supremacy. His power is at an end. And with this evidence before them, the Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess the justice and the righteousness of God. Now finally, all that must be demonstrated has been shown and it is time to end the conflict. The choice is ours, my friends. Isaiah 45, 22 to 24, Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none other. I have sworn by myself. The word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. He shall say, Surely in the Lord I have righteousness and strength. To him men shall come, and all shall be ashamed who are incensed against him. That's what has to be demonstrated. That text has to be fully demonstrated before the great plan can come to an end. God has told us what to expect. It shouldn't be a mystery to anyone who reads the Bible. We are here as the final piece in the great puzzle called the great controversy between Christ and Satan. Who is doing it right? Who can you trust? Who do you believe? Is God really handling it right? That's our purpose. That's our mission. Nothing else is really relevant except that. And the only question left for us is a simple question. Do we have faith enough to obey? Do we have faith that will lead to total obedience? Do we trust God without questioning? Even when we don't understand. Even when it seems like He's no longer on our side. And it's all over for us. Will we be on the inside of that city, my friends? That's all that matters. On the inside, not on the outside. Let us kneel as we close this. Father in heaven, this has been a very long and agonizing process. From the first day that Satan was cast out of heaven to the time when Jesus died on the cross, and now we've come 6,000 years down in human history. Lord, you have placed us here on this earth with the most important part yet to be demonstrated of how this can all end. Father, may we understand. May we understand what's at stake right here. May we realize that we are here to demonstrate, to prove to the unfallen universe and to the fallen world that you, God, can be trusted, no matter what the outside evidence shows. That even though things don't make sense to us, that you will deliver and prove your way to be right. So, Lord, help us to be on that side. May we have the sense of who we are and why it is important that we are here. May we participate in this final vindication of your name, without which there can be no end to the plan that Satan has devised. May we realize how crucial this generation is to the final events of earth's history. And may there be nothing more important to us than receiving the seal of God as your promise that this is a people safe to take into heaven. And I pray this because Jesus has promised it and we have faith that his promises come true. In his name, amen.